Our lecture today is on play and the notion of play, and all of you are players. And as you have told me over time, that play is the nature of who you are. And all of you love play. It defines who you are. It expresses who you are. And you have told me that many of you started competing as young as four and five years old. So play is a large part of our life. But what's interesting, we've talked about this also, is that we have many scholarship athletes in here. And play is a very important, essential part of who you are but you get no credit for the play that you do here at the university. In any other activity, if you were in music, or if you were in theater, or if you were in the arts of any sort, and you did your activity, you would get credit toward a degree. In athletics, the credits do not apply for the degree. So we have swimmers in here, we have football players, and they spend tons and tons of time, but they get no credit toward a degree. Just think about that a little bit. The university sells the product of play. The university markets through our program, we've talked about this, that the largest salaries that occur in the university are not to faculty or even to the president, it's to the football coach. Those salaries are disproportionate to the notion of what it is in academics. No place else on campus do we have people working with students in an academic support role in which that person is not a faculty member. None of the coaches are part of the faculty. They are separated from what they do. But, as former President Gibbs said here at the University of Idaho, there's no greater window into the university than our football program. At the same time, when he was quizzed and challenged about the salaries for the coach, he said, when 16,000 people go to that chemistry professor's lab and watch him do an experiment, we'll pay him the same as we pay our football coach. So the window to the university is look through the realm of play. And all of you are players. Now, what is this thing? What does it mean about play? When we talk about play per se, what's kind of interesting about it is that when people express what it is, they never talk about it in objective terms. Instead, they talk about it in the notion of what we do at the institution, and it's almost to the point of being lyrical. Now you notice the picture up here? Picture? Unfortunately, all my pictures are of old white guys, and I apologize for that. But I can't find any people that I know right in the field uh, who have notoriety that's not an old white guy, so I'm sorry about that. But this guy here is Drew Highland, and Drew Highland played basketball at Princeton. He's a philosophy professor at Trinity College uh, in Connecticut. And when he talks about play in a very lyric sense, he was actually at Princeton. The basketball thing is that he played on the All-American team at Princeton back in the late 50s and 60s. So you know this guy is really an old white guy. But at that period of time, he also played with Bill Bradley. So when we look at that, I'm going to have to read this for you because Tom says I have to. Play is one of those phenomena where we again and again achieve that sense of totality. Meaning that when we play, we feel like a complete and whole person. (coughs) Two of the football guys up in front made a comment to me a little bit ago about one of their teammates who had quit the team. And it was not exactly a supporting remark that I got from them. And their notion is that when you're a member of a team, that you have a responsibility to be part of that total product, right? And if you quit something, there's something about the loss of your character, that you're not a part of that, right? So there's something about this thing of play that we feel that we are part of, of becoming and being. Drew Highland, a picture of him there again, said that intimation of compliment meaning it supports who we are, it's important who we are. 
and that play itself comes to you as you come to play. Do all of you remember the first time you got a uniform? You will be pretty little. You won't be very big. I see Spencer over here in this side, and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I see Spencer outside of this class in the ice arena. And Spencer plays ice hockey, and I teach figure skating, two very different sports. I come to the arena with a nice small little bag that has my skates in it. And there is a mystical quality of putting my skates on. I don't know if Spencer's ever noticed that, but I'm there a good half hour before class. I have to get my skates on, and it takes time, and I have to think about it, and you prepare. Now, Spencer does that, too, because he complements his life experience by hockey. He's got a bag big enough to stick a woman in it. I've never seen anything so big in my life as that bag that he carries. It doesn't have to be that bag, big, but it is that big because he carries everything that he can think of that he might need in that bag. I don't know what's in it, but I have a feeling I do. It probably has all the issues and things that he needs to play the game, plus all the incidentals that go along with it. I'm assuming. He's shaking his head. Yes. So this is a compliment. We play these games, and it extends ourselves to the game, and the game extends itself to us. What Highland is talking about is that when we play, we are a part of the game, and the game is a part of us. And that responsive openness is the conversation between we and the game. When I go to the rink, there's the aura of the rink. There's the smell of the ice. When I taught at the United States Military Academy and taught ice skating, the first day I went into Holland Arena, I went on the ice and laid down and hugged the arena, hugged the ice. People thought I was nuts. But there's something about it, and Spencer, you understand what I'm talking about, there's something about the smell There's something about the arena. There's something about the weather inside the arena. There's something about the temperature. There's something about the sound. When the ice hockey guys are on the ice, it is a noisy, bangy place. When the ice skaters, figure skaters on the ice, it's a quiet, lyrical place with a little bit of music in the background. The sport or activity comes to us. So he talks about this as responsive openness. There's another guy here. I couldn't find his picture, but I think he's been dead about 50 years. But this guy is an anthropologist who looked at the notion of play. And he says, play is necessary to affirm our lives. I don't know if you know this or not, but every animal in the, in the kingdom of animals all play all of their life. However, people quit playing. People stop playing. But all of you in here know that you're not going to do that, right? Because play is a part of affirmation of your life. And if you don't play, you miss out on the important element of it. What I worry about is people like Conrad up here, who two weeks ago said to me that it's all about winning. And I made a comment to him, and he came up and talked to me afterwards about it. I said, if you measure everything by the outcome, you may quit doing the activity. So play should be, Conrad, more than the outcome. It should be the effect as while you do it. I will bet that you play football because of what goes on on the field and the relationship between you and the game and you and your friends. You both, you and Tyson, made a comment about that, about somebody quitting the game. You made an inference that there's something wrong when somebody quits because of that relationship. So play is necessary to affirm our lives. That means to tell us who we are and what we do. 